Greetings, dear friends. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. As always, we gather once a month around the time of the full moon from all the corners of the world to be together in a circle, to reflect together on the work ahead of us to awaken the souls of our nations. I welcome you on behalf of the 2025 initiative together with the Hikal Group and Flanchale Group. Together, three hour groups invite us together to be in silence, reflecting and sharing advancing the work of unfolding the divine plan to the best of our capacity. Thank you for being with us. And I invite Uta to take us into this continuous journey. Mm. Thanks for the introduction, Alexander. And hello, everyone. Welcome. Yes, continuous journey. Um, we have been looking for a few uh, months on very big entities or blocks or regions in our council chamber of elders in training and um, when we came to the theme of uh, looking at the field, the relationship field between Russia and the West, we have come to our limits uh, two months ago. Uh, those who were present uh, can remember that. And um, yeah, last months we had a review of our tools of what we have reached so far and what lies ahead uh, so today we pick up on it it seems we have some more work to do to move beyond judging in order to have a clear view when it comes to the to the world's tension at large. And we are continuing to work towards it. And it seems that we need the quality of grace, a heart of forgiveness, in order to be really able to see through this current dense working out of collective karma collective human karma. It really takes a wide spectrum view, a large time perspective to, yeah, to move beyond our usual judging. It seems that wherever we, we still have pain and uh, wherever we still judge, we must dig deeper into ourselves, into history, until we understand all players. And when we see, we understand. And then we reach what DK calls a completed point of view concerning that specific issue or angle that we are looking at. And then a vision may appear of a possible next step for that world situation and maybe also uh, a possible work for us may become visible. What can we do? And when this happens, then we can become causal, we can make a difference. 
And this question is still to be explored, how to do that, how to play a causal role beyond holding space in a specific world circumstance or for a specific nation, which we are doing until now. We are holding space. So we will continue exploring this and uh, learning together, doing the next steps. And uh, today in this Libra moment, we probably will have a more integrating experience with Australia as a middle nation between West and East. And here perhaps we may witness a balancing process underway. Um, we will start with a meditation in our council chamber, preparing the space. And then we will invite our representative for Australia, Rob, uh, who will speak on behalf of the Australian group. And he will speak in the first person, like we did the last while, as the voice of Australia. And after the meditation, we will have a sharing. Okay. So let us prepare for our work. Withdrawing our attention into our inner stillness, our inner space. Grounding in our body, breathing. Breathing with the earth. And as the soul, we stand in love, clarity, and freedom in this incarnation. And we open our consciousness now to the call for planetary psychosynthesis, for contributing to it. And following this call, let us now make our way to the beautiful building set in nature, which we already know well. Entering into the quiet and clear and spacious council chamber of elders in training. Sense the atmosphere in the chamber, the geometrical harmony. A safe space. Taking our places as elders in training in this geometric order. As part of the one planetary server, 
taking a moment to embody this function. In the center of the chamber, let us visualize the flame, the flame of our combined, sustained will to love. Tuning our hearts to it. And holding together this space of intent, sustained love. And tuning now also into the mental space of the council chamber, a calm, clear, lighted space. We are continuing to weave it in telepathic harmony. And it vibrates to the rate of the Ajna center of the planet. And through this vibration, we are linked with our fellow world workers in all nations. Holding now our shared lighted space stable, and being aware of four great Deva beings helping us to do so. One at each direction, the north, south, east, and west. And we are aligned with the ashramic co-workers who support and guide this work. Just let us take a moment to sense their presence. And now, holding this space, let us invite the representative of, of Australia now. Holding space for Australia. I will seek to speak as if through the soul-infused consciousness of my nation. I am the soul of the nation of Australia. My people live, plough their farms, graze their cattle and sheep, and cut their great mines on this most ancient of Earth's continents. I am among the most multicultural of nations. Half of my people trace their ancestry to Britain. A fifth are from Asia, the rest from most parts of Europe and the world. In large measure, these groups live in cheerful and respectful cooperation, their boundaries naturally eroding as the generations pass. Each has its own soul and soul-infused personality, and I am their realized and emerging unity. It is my First Nations who are the most deeply troubled, struggling to adapt to what was imposed upon them. 
They had occupied the land for 65,000 years, understanding and respecting its limitations, protecting it. For these peoples, British colonization in the late 18th century was a catastrophe. From the ashes of that catastrophe would arise a new nation. The first colonial settlers were mostly British convicts. Gradually, a penal, gradually the penal colony developed an economy based on farming, fishing, convict labor, and free settlers from Britain. A major non-British contingent arrived from China for the gold rushes of the mid-19th century. And these still comprise a visible and valued part of the community. After World War II came waves of immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe. Then came those from Asia, especially after the doomed enterprise of the war in Vietnam, in which my government pledged its loyalty to its great protector, the United States. Later came waves from other lands, but at Federation in 1901, I was still essentially a British outpost. Even in 1949, there was no such thing as Australian citizenship. My people were subjects of the British Crown. On the sole plane, I am at one with all nations. On the plane of personality, this is not so. I look out through the middle brain, my street level view of the world. From there, I observe my connection with other nations in heritage, culture, and defense. These nations swirl around me. My strongest connections are with the USA and the UK but then overwhelmingly with Asia. On the personality plane, I see China as threatening in her ambitions to expand her, her sphere of influence. In her actions in the South China Sea, I see the germs of what may happen in the Pacific Islands to my Northeast. Her commercial interests there are persuasive I fear her influence will become naval also, endangering the safety I have, I have for two centuries enjoyed in my oceanic isolation. Though feeling threatened by the coercive aspiration of China, my people have stood their ground, resisting China's naval threat and surviving her trade bans. She expresses disapproval th through punishing tariffs on my wines, grains, and mineral ores. In doing so, she disrupts herself more than she does my own nation, as we have proved able to switch markets when she switches sources of supply. From this arises a measure of mutual respect and therein may lie a long-term prospect of peaceful cooperation. India is a puzzle to me, but the relationship is strong in practical terms, deriving from a shared imperial past and perhaps a shared curiosity about each other. She is at present the source of my most rapid immigration intake. Indonesia, too, is a mystery, an Islamic nation which my people do not, do not always understand. However, we are long past its confrontation with Malaya of the 1960s and the Timor-Leste fight for independence in the 1990s. In each of those confrontations, my government sided against Indonesia. 
But these tensions have passed and relations between our two peoples are friendly and mutually trusting. Indonesia, the world's most populous Islamic nation, is moderate in the expression of her faith. In the long term, the dialogue between Muslim Indonesia and mostly Christian Australia may offer a doorway to understanding between these two political religious faiths. My people are still primarily European in thought, half trace British heritage. 40% still favor the British monarch as Australian head of state. This relates to the past and must eventually be released. However, I need to wait until the people are ready. I have a crucial role to play among the Pacific Island, among the Pacific Island nations, but have not always recognized and met my responsibilities there. This has created a vacuum, gladly filled by another. My government now works with skill to address this situation. This experience highlights the dangers of failing to understand that the survival priorities of our neighbors are also survival imperatives for ourselves. My people are learning quickly. Sensing exposure to the North, my people place great value on their military alliance with the United States. My nation is small, while she is great, but I am not without influence. Even a small nation can diminish the isolation of a great one. However, such influence comes at a cost. The involvement of my nation in wars in Korea, Vietnam, and Iraq is now recognized as tragically misconceived. Japan, my fierce enemy of World War II, has long been a close friend. She is a major trading partner and, a and both a tourist source and destination. My people are loyal. I was loyal to Great Britain for most of two centuries and have been an unshakable ally to, to the United States since the end of World War II. Loyalty is a great virtue, but not so are the economic and emotional dependence which may accompany such relationships. It is a relief to see some distancing now taking place. But more is required if my people are to meet the role now required of me. The continent on which I dwell lies at the concourse of three great oceans. I stand between Europe and North America, almost within Asia, but not quite. I supply raw materials to the world. I'm European by inheritance, but Asian in geography and commerce. China is my greatest market. Some of my people have begun to understand the brutality with which my First Nations were driven from their lands in the course of European colonization. The primary goal was to occupy farming and grazing land. Was the brutality unavoidable? It may have been beyond the capability of humanity at the time to manage such a transition more humanely. The impulse to conquest and control has been the path of many civilizations. This, my history, must be taught in schools. 
that we can alert, that we can emerge from its shadow. The Europeanness of my people has long caused them to sense or imagine a threat from the great Asian nations to the north, especially those whose governments differ, differ so greatly from the European model. Thus, I have maintained a strong alliance with the USA, and my people repeatedly seek to prove themselves a reliable ally to that great nation. The actions I have taken in consequence have sometimes been unwise and sometimes catastrophic. My people must evolve from their dependence on the United States, as they are doing with the mother country, Great Britain. Those two nations are trusted and valued friends, but I must gradually extend the circle of my reach such that it becomes inclusive towards all nations. This will take generations of patient action. In the meantime, my nation must be able to defend herself. I spend 1.9% of my national GDP on defense. This is less than the comparable figures for, for the United States and the UK, but more than those for China and the European Union. I share long-standing military alliances with the USA and UK, and more recently with India and Japan. If I am to fill the role now required, what is it that I have that I may work with? The fires of Ray 1 and 7 burn in the land and its first peoples and flow through its mineral and vegetable king kingdoms. They flowed also through British invasion and colonization. From Britain, I have the inherited strength and truthfulness of Ray II. For the future, I will need the practicality of Ray III and the harmony through conflict of Ray IV. The first of these has long been evident. The, the influence of Ray IV may become clear as my soul-infused personality addresses the task ahead. My nation is a middle power in every sense, European in language and culture, Asian in geography and economy, neither strong nor weak in military and financial terms. What is its task? Certainly to model to the world a middle path through which may be seen the light of understanding among nations and from which may emerge a healing of the ancient wounds within. My nation must understand its responsibilities in the affairs of the world. It must, it must think with clarity and independence, speak with simplicity and truth, and act with the patience of a bridge builder. Let the silence now settle in the council chamber. Holding space for that which has been received. Letting our inner response arise, listening to it.
And now letting go of all that is known, expanding our consciousness, swinging into the ashramic thought field. Expanding. And open our consciousness to the divine plan, to that part of the divine plan which seeks expression through Australia, moving forward into the new era. Let us take a couple of minutes in this receptivity. And gently let us release now the high receptivity, bringing our focus back into the council chamber. And just remaining for another moment in each other's presence, just resting and replenishing in our shared space. And when we're ready, we may open our eyes to note down our impressions in preparation for our sharing.
Okay. And so let us open the floor now for sharing our impressions on behalf of Australia and keeping the meditative attitude, trying to be brief and synthetic, and also talking slowly, also for Margot, who is taking our notes, and for people who don't speak English as their native language. Let us hold a moment of silence after each sharing to let it settle into our shared space. Dear Australia, you have arrived in our awareness with a sense of self-acceptance. And within this circle of a family of nations, your nation coming of age to meet the challenges of a new era a third stage or step in transition to become a balancing influence of integration within and between the hemispheres of our world. I honor and salute the spirit of your people all your ancestors and the ray synthesis that is uniquely your heritage of the spirit of the lands of Australia. May your people now step into their sole purpose for the era to come we salute you in brotherhood. Dear Australia, Thank you for your conscious, heartfelt, and humble declaration of who you are. I hear you and see you as a conscious link between the most ancient and the most far-reaching future. You are a bridge between the root races of humanity. Absorbing and radiating the qualities the consciousness, the evolution of all. I see you eventually a key player when new lands emerge into the light of day 
from the depths of oceanic mother of creation, new yet old land, arising from the sea. And you will already understand the meaning of that emergence and how to meet it. Your leadership will bridge the subjective world of meaning and the objective world of human co-creation. Thank you for being our brother. to Australia, you are a sample of the new world, even if this new world has been built in the past from coloni colonization. Nowadays, you um, are, in my eyes, an endemic physical space encompassing civiliz civilizations of different parts of the world and being a bridge builder between people who came to inhabit you. An example for, all, for other parts of the world where humans in search for refuge and in their wandering try to find roots to build a new civilization. Thank you for your being an example.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rob, and everyone who responded. I am wondering if uh, you, Rob, could speak a bit about, a bit more about this um, middle nation. Perhaps also about your cooperation with other middle nations. Yes. This place being a middle power, we are not in a position to take great decisions that will be done by the great nations. Nor are we so small that we must await what others decide. Our task as a middle nation is to participate and influence and to work together, not just with the great nations, but also with the other middle nations so that we can exert influence in a wholly constructive way being able to see in our best moments. In our best moments, being able to see with a degree of impartiality, which is far more difficult for the great nations. Mm. There is, there are many, many nations like us. And at the present time, the group in Australia is working with a group in Denmark and a group in Canada, forming a triangle of middle countries, specifically seeking to address in a purely subjective way, what is the role of a group of middle countries in what's taking place in the conflagration which is taking place. That triangle is geographically a great one. It, 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 it crosses the world and it crosses to a degree, crosses culture, although it does not cross the Asian culture. But geographically, it is in three great spheres of influence. Europe, America, North America, or the whole of America, whichever you like, and the Indo-Pacific, which is where Australia is. It seems that it would be possible to interlace many such triangles, hundreds, thousands, of triangles of thought, triangles of shared, a shared sense of responsibility to humanity, crisscrossing the globe, sometimes in large arcs, such as Australia, Denmark, Canada, sometimes in local triangles of neighboring nations. Mm and that each of these triangles is a thread of light. And as the number of triangles, if the number of triangles were to grow, the light may grow with it across yeah. the globe. Mm. Thanks a lot, Rob, for these deep thoughts. Your group meets every week or every two weeks, right? Yeah. 
Yes, the Australian group meets in meditation each week. Mm -hmm. um, the triangle meets three times a year. But there is, and there is constant dialogue, frequent dialogue between the members of the Australian group, of course, um, and dialogue from time to time throughout the year between the three nations, between the groups of the three nations. Mm -hmm. We always have to remember that we are just three little groups doing our best, each in our own country seeking, seeking to work with the energy of our own country, with the energy of the soul of our own country, and such as we can or may be able to contribute that into the triangle of energy. Beautiful. I have another question. Um, um, and it is about the European past and the loyalty to the Western countries and the slow process of distancing uh, I think you said a healthy distancing process going on and coming into more of an integration uh, with the with the locality um, it resonated for me very much with uh, a, a similar process that hopefully will be happening also for Israel uh, in a very different um, different setup. Yeah, and you said it will you, know, you, you have to wait as, as a soul of the nation, you have to wait until the people are ready. It's really, as you also said, it's a we need so much patience. These cycles of development of a nation are so much bigger than our personal cycles. Yeah, so I just want to appreciate this. Yes, there are many threads in that question. Um, the parallel between Israel and Australia there is truth in that. Both nations emerging from a period of brutality. But perhaps that's always the case. The emergence of nations, both being in the middle. The task, of course, the task for Israel is so much more complex at the present time. The task for Australia is balance. Um, the, we were a British outpost until the middle of the last century. Well, at least until the beginning of the 20th century. So it takes a long time to grow away from that. Um, and also the people grow away from it at different speeds. Um, if we consider the soul infused personality, consciousness of the nation to be firstly through its thinkers and then radiating or permeating down through the greater mass of the people. 
the awareness level amongst the thinkers is far greater than amongst the mass of the nation. Mm -hmm. and, and when I mention that 40% of the nation still favors the British monarch as head of state, I should say that's partly because they mistrust the models, the Republican models that have been put to it by a government that really didn't want a republic. But that 40% uh, really, especially down amongst the greater mass of the population, an awareness of the need to change is much greater uh, amongst the thinking portion of the nation, the, the artists, the creators, the thinkers. I suspect the same, exactly the same is true of Israel. An awareness of the complexity of the situation and the complexity of the history, it, I, I should think is very high among the thinkers of the population, but mm. perhaps less so amongst the greater mass of the population. So coming back to Australia, the key is balance. Where is the balancing point? It is not in the UK. It is not in the United States. It is here at the junction of three oceans, mm. poised between vast continents and great cultures. That is where this nation stands. That is where this nation lies and must stand. Mm -hmm. Sounds so healthy, really. <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes, Stacia. It is Martha and oh. I only say that to indicate that I speak as a member, uh, not as the focalizer, but the importance of what has been said about the emergence of countries through extreme brutality, I do not believe that will always be the case as we uh, galvanize the light energy that is around us through this important work in the soul of nations and the triangle of middle nations and the future development of triangles among the nations as you speak of. Because what is happening now, and we can see it happening in, in Israel, the people voice is becoming ever more energized and we can see that when this happens there are emergence of new nations nations we do not know about that are needing to find their voice in ever um, increasing numbers part of this great trend has been driven by the population explosion and some of our countries are far too large some of our countries are being patronized in the wrong way by the more powerful countries so what i hope to speak to is our own developing skill envisioning the future that we want, because in many ways it is up to us. And so I thank you, group of nations, for this pioneer work and this opportunity to imagine ourselves into becoming the future itself. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Martha. I'm sorry, I can't 
floor. Oh, there he is. Good. Good. Thank you, Rob, and gratitude to the group who prepared this sharing. One of the questions that come and as a recognition of opportunity that Australia has having such a complex history uh, as you have, and you mentioned, uh, Rob, and uh, your sharing that some of people of Australia start recognizing the brutality of uh, how the First Nation being uh, treated. And it's an issue that many nations around the world had to deal with and uh, still didn't solve that issue completely. How do we awaken to that responsibility of the colonial colonial past? Recognizing and seeing the way to heal. Buddha mentioned in meditation grace. What does it mean, grace, when we think about that past? How do we, how deep we should go into to clean that wound before it starts healing? Mm -hmm. So if you have any thoughts on that, uh, would be a very uh, important topic to bring up now in this while we're in the energies of the full moon of libra holding in our collective field yes alexander it it is a a question which deeply troubles the nation increasingly troubles the nation i think the, the short answer is it must be taught in schools the history must be taught in schools. When I went to school, there was no mention of British brutality in the process for coronation. Not a word. Um, it's only quite recently that we have started to become aware of just what happened and how brutal it was. Um, so the people are gradually, almost one by one, starting to come to groups with what actually happened. And as you say, I think this happened everywhere where there was, that's how nations were built. In the case of Britain, it was colonization. But if I think back through the histories of any civilization, conquest and control, has been the process. So in Australia, it is firstly a matter of awareness. Um, and for that to be achieved, it must be taught in the schools. We now have enough information to do that. And I think certainly the teacher population is highly receptive to this. It's a matter of can we get to the point where the curriculum authorities will authorize a sufficiently frank presentation once that's done i think it starts to become natural people understand what was done they understand the karma there's been a big question here about what's called the black armband view of history um, are we responsible for the sins of the past some in government have argued that no, we are the current generation. We're not responsible for whatever may have been done in the past. I don't think everybody buys that. I most certainly don't buy it. Um, I think 
we have inherited the karma of occupation. It is a national karma, especially on those who, well, perhaps entirely on those of British heritage. No, that's not true. Even those who immigrate to this country from non-British sources, Asia, they come to enjoy the benefits of this nation which was created through occupation. And so they do take on that karma. So it is for all of us. And for healing to occur, first of all, we have to be aware of it. And that is beginning to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely part of grace to become aware of something and hold it in our consciousness. There was a comment in the chat from one of Daisha's, um, so I would say from the Canadian group. Thank you, Rob, for speaking into the pioneer work of the Triangle of Three Middle Nations. This little seed represents pioneer work regarding the emergence of more nations that are coming into being, as we see in South Sudan, Slovakia, etc. Thank you for unmuting me, Alexander. Um, it's Desha from the Soul of Canada group. Thank you, Rob, for addressing the karma of colonialized nations. Canada is very similar in where we are with coming to terms with our tragic genocidal history. And I agree that the first step is knowing the truth, hearing the stories, bearing witness with kindness and open hearts to indigenous people who have the courage to come forward and share and to bear witness to how difficult it is for the mass of Canadian citizenry to struggle to find a point of balance between the lie they have heard from colonial government for 200 years and the truth of what happened. So having great open-hearted understanding that this is a 
very difficult time. In Canada, we've two dedicated days to recognize truth and reconciliation and indigenous honoring indigenous nations. We've set those aside across the country. And it takes time for us to wake up and it takes time for us to struggle with our own internal sense of balance. To move forward, as my Indigenous friends would say, to move forward together in a good way. And part of the meditation that we do as the soul of Canada recognizes the Indigenous values of interconnectedness, and reciprocity. <sighs> Those values are the soul of Canada values that we feel we've identified, however well we can do that. So great gratitude to Rob for stating it so beautifully for Australia and Canada has the same struggle and it's something gradually we're coming to terms with. Thank you for listening. Hearing Dacia speak reminded me that I had not given a sufficient description of the way that triangle works. I mean, the Canada, Australia, Denmark triangle. Um, I see we meet three times a year. That's for a meditation process and discussion but each of those groups holds the triangle in its thought uh, whenever it comes together within its own group. So my group visualizes the triangle every time it does its own or as a, as a prelude to its own meditation, which is done weekly. So the subjective contact, the subjective link is frequent. This is Margot from Canada speaking as a community member. I long held an ideal about Indigenous ways of life and still honor that in terms of stewardship of the land and the animal and plant kingdom. However, colonization does not just apply to Britain, to Spain, to Portugal, to China, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The First Nations were also colonizers. They also took slaves. So I see this as humanity and the groups of nations that have been here for millennia. I don't know if that happened in Australia. I know it happened in Aotearoa in New Zealand, and it certainly happened here in Canada. So may 
peace prevail. May we recognize and honor our shared humanity as we move forward together in a good way. May peace prevail. Yes, Margot, I, I see it the same, that the, our First Nations here in Australia, there was a time in which they occupied the land. They did not displace another people as far as we know, but they certainly disrupted the lower kingdoms. But then they learned to work with those in stewardship, as you, as you suggest. I sense that uh, we are now, as we going through the change of epochs, change of times, we are called to recognize these old patterns. And as we recognize them, to make our choice. Very liberal activity. Is that the pattern we want to be continued? We want to acknowledge it as the wrong pattern that was right or uh, was functional in the past as the level of human consciousness was lower. And therefore, as a principle of grace, we recognized it and seal it there in the past and start making right choices as we move forward. My sense that it's a very important distinction to uh, hold. Alexander, can you uh, can you again say the distinction? Um, I didn't catch it. I was yeah. Please please say it again. I think how to say it differently that it would be more clear. Uh, the 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 thought that I have. As we, as the conflict in the world, the global conflict pretty much between the old and the new is raging now. And we are pretty much stand in the planetary Kurukshetra. We start recognizing that certain patterns of behavior that were common in the past and maybe even justified, they not working anymore. As we move into the soul consciousness, we become more conscious as a species. And therefore, we are called to make our choice now. Either we follow the old pattern or we establish the new pattern. I don't have clear answers how it is done. So that's why I offered this as a question for our reflection. As we recognize the wrongdoings of the past, what we uh, as trained meditators should do, how we 
approach these questions because as you probably noticed conflicts that rage now the uh, they often are justified by injustices of the past. So how do we process what's been done wrong in the history? And what is the right attitude we take as we move forward in regard to our not enlightened past. I would like to offer a thought toward your question, Alexander, because the choice point, especially in this Libra full moon, Grand Cardinal Cross, Sun, Moon, Mars, Pluto, Cross, um, is that between evolution and initiation. And, and what I mean by that is if we embrace the concept that human evolution has occurred, especially via reincarnation, then we can see if we look at the long history of human evolution, really long, like hundreds of thousands, maybe millions, billions of years, that there's no type of person perhaps that we have not embodied. There's no crime we have not committed. There is no such thing as we've never met a moment of grace and awakening. And so the choice to come up to the point where we say, yes, we've, we've done it all, we've been it all, we, in forgiving ourselves, we uh, forgive and understand others. But at this point, we need to stand in our awareness and power and choose self-initiated growth, which is initiation. And at that point, we go back and take responsibility for everything, not through guilt or shame or condemnation, but out of empathy for how really long and painful the process of evolution itself is. Can I comment on that? I, I think that's an excellent observation. It depends on the perspective on the, on the, the length of perspective, I think. I've always been puzzled by why did DK write so favorably of the British Empire, given what we now know about the manner in which it was developed at great cost to others. I've never been able to understand it until I came to realize that DK was taking a vast perspective he wasn't look at looking at this that took as something that took place in the space of one or two centuries but something that took place in the space of many millennia as part of the 
evolution of humanity and the necessary progression from states of human existence towards whatever it was that was going to be required um, using the means humanity using the means at its disposal at the time which were pretty brutal but that's where humanity was at that time Uh, Jill here, UK. I also agree with your comments, Deborah. Uh, none of us are aware as yet of our past doings. And I think we all pay back our karma. And so it will eventually right itself. And... Uh, Thank you for the lovely presentation, Australia. I think you uh, serve a useful link between one side of the world and the other. Thank you everyone for this very deep exploration together. Um, and uh, next month we will probably have the opportunity to continue this exploration as we will uh, have a psychosynthesis perspective on indigenous people. First nation people. So let us look forward to this. Let us hold this exploration during the months so it can gestate in us and uh, We continued next month. Let us just take another moment as a family of nations here. To just hold all that we have touched together Hold it in our group chalice for a process of absorption, transmutation, and expression. extend these offerings to Australia especially as gifts on the way. And let us offer our work back up to the divine plan. And return now to our personal grounding. So the next Nations Lab session will be on November 12th. And uh, Alexander, you may have some 
edit announcement. Yes, um, I invite us to uh, continue holding the tension of the group field for the five days of the full moon today when it first day. Also invite you to join the gathering in the garden that will be happening the Thursday at the same time as the Nations Lab today meeting on October 17th at 6 p.m. Universal Time. And on Friday, sorry, Saturday at 6.30 uh, p.m. Universal Time meditation for the common good. So please join us and continue holding the daily rhythm of the vigil at 8 p.m universal time. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob, and the Australian group, and all of us for this deep work to be continued. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>